Okay, so we pick it up at um, loss limitations. Um, <clears throat> there are three different types of loss limitations that the shareholder of an S-Corp must meet before they can deduct the loss. Uh, two of them are at-risk amount and passive activity limitations. So, um, they're, for S-Corps, it's pretty much like what we talked about in partnerships. So, the one I really want to um, <clears throat> concentrate on here is the first one, which is the tax basis limitation, because it is different with an S-Corp. And so, with an S-Corp, losses, a, 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 sh a shareholder's pro rata losses that they can deduct are limited to their tax basis in the stock shares. And so, that sounds familiar, right? Um, <clears throat> what's unusual, and we didn't talk about this yesterday, um, is the fact that when you're determining basis of a, of a shareholder of an S Corp, you don't add the amount of debt that an S Corp has to the shareholder's basis like you would with a partnership. And so uh, all things, all other things being equal, um, an S Corp shareholder is going to have a lower basis than would a um, <clears throat> S Corp shareholder if the entity had debt. Because with the partnership, you, you add the debt proportionally to each partner, partner's basis, and with an S Corp, you don't. And so uh, the, the tax basis limitation snags many S Corp shareholders because of that reason. <clears throat> well, um, what happens if you have a loss that's in excess of tax basis? Well, you just have to wait till sometime in the future when you have subsequent increases in basis, and then you can offset that uh, with whatever carryover loss you have. You can also, and this is where that second line comes in, you can also make direct loans to the S Corp and um, to the extent of tax basis of the shareholder and then any basis and in any direct loans made to the S Corp, you can deduct basis or deduct the loss. Um, and so if you had tax basis of 10 and you had a direct loan of 20 and the loss was 50, you would first deduct 10,000 and reduce your tax basis to zero and then you can deduct another 20, which is the basis in the direct loans to the S Corp. And so you'd have 20, in my example, you'd have 20,000 uh, losses uh, that you would carry over to subsequent years. Now, in subsequent years, any net increase in basis for the year first restores the shareholder's debt basis and then the shareholder's stock basis. Also, any uh, loan repayment in excess of the shareholder's debt basis trigger, triggers a taxable uh, gain to the shareholder. So make sure you understand all that. That is a different animal. What also is different, let's 
So let me move through this. Oh, note if you if you sell your stock before you uh, create any additional basis, then the suspended loss that you carry over just disappears. And so next I want to talk about <clears throat> self-employment income. And so this is different than how it's treated for partnership purposes. S-Corp shareholders, uh, their allocable share of ordinary business income or loss is not classified as self-employment income, unlike partnerships. Now, if they are an employee as well, uh, you would pay a salary to that employee shareholder and the S-Corp would deduct that and of course pay their portion of uh, withholding taxes and of course they would withhold social security taxes from the employees paycheck and so um, the incentive here to avoid employment taxes would be what well pay pay the shareholder a fairly low amount of income and just uh, pay, pay them in, in distributions, right? And, and and make that a big part of their compensation, not the salary. Well, the, the IRS is on to this scheme and so the IRS requires S-Corp employees be, who are also shareholders be paid a reasonable salary for their efforts uh, if they come in and deem the salary unreasonable they'll uh, have the S Corp and the employee share, shareholder restate income to you know essentially the distribution would be considered salary and you know who knows how many years of tax returns may have to be restated so it's kind of a headache <clears throat> let's see all right so let's talk about operating distributions this is under the heading of distributions. Um, for S Corps with no ENP. ENP is a concept that uh, applies to C Corps, not S Corps. But an S Corp can have ENP when they were formerly a C Corp and at the time of the conversion to an S Corp they had E&P, earnings and profits. Okay. If they were either an S Corp from the very beginning and not ever a C Corp or at the time of the conversion from C to S status the corporation had no E&P here are the rules for operating distributions. And so this should sound familiar. Distributions are tax-free to the extent of the shareholder's basis. Any excess distribution uh, excess in excess of basis is capital gain. 
So that should sound familiar, should be a no-brainer. Now, for S-Corps with ENP, that corporation is um, required to set up what, what they call an accumulated, uh, let's see, what's that called? Accumulated adjustments account, okay? And so if you look at the formula, it's kind of like EMP, but not exactly. So on, on page 10, they have the formula. You got your beginning year A, A AAA balance and then you you add certain things separately stated income and gain plus ordinary income items and then you know you have your deductions and so you come up with your end of year AAA balance note that unlike a, a shareholder stock basis you can actually have a negative Triple A, but to the ex uh, and notice that any distributions made uh, cannot cause the triple A to go negative. So you, uh, basically, what that means is the only thing that can make it uh, a triple A account go negative is is like ordinary losses and separately stated losses as well as non-deductible expenses. All right, so if the S-Corp has ENP and makes an operating distribution, the distribution first comes out of the AAA account, okay? So that would be a distribution out of AAA if you look at the AAA formula. And then next, it comes out of ENP, and then after that, it comes out of, well, it reduces the shareholder stock basis. And so distributions from an S-Corp uh, with E&P, well, the distribution from the AAA is treated the same as uh, distributions when the S-Corp does not have E&P. They're non-taxable to the extent of the shareholder's basis, and they create capital gains if they exceed the shareholder's basis. If uh, the S-Corp makes... Uh, a distribution from accumulated ENP, the second thing there, the distribution is taxable as a dividend to the shareholder once an S Corp's accumulated ENP is fully distributed, the re remaining distributions reduce the shareholder's remaining basis uh, and are non-taxable any excess uh, distribution in excess of basis is, of course, capital gain. So the only thing that's different here is how you treat EMP. If if they didn't have it this way, set up this way, essentially, what a C corp could do, a C corp with EMP. To avoid having to have uh, shareholders taxed uh, on those distributions as dividends, they could simply, without this rule, convert the, the C Corp to an S Corp and 
just make distributions and as long as it's not in uh, excess of uh, the shareholders basis it would be tax-free so that's why you have this rule now what happens if you have um, property distributions Well, there's tax consequences to both the S-Corp and the, the shareholder. And so most people think, and you may have thought this when you started this chapter, that S-Corps were, were never taxed at the corporate level. Well you're about to find out that that's not true. Um, an S-Corp can be taxed at the corporate level in certain circumstances, and this would be one of them, where they, uh, instead of distribute cash, they distribute other types of property. When they do, the S-Corp uh, recognizes a gain, but not a loss, as if they sold the property for fair market value and then just turned around and recognized the gain itself, right? Now, shareholder, when they receive property, they recognize their distributive share of the deemed gain and increase their stock basis accordingly. And the property distribution is valued at fair market value of the, uh, on the date the property is received. And of course taxability of the distribution is, is determined based upon the distribution rules discussed previously. In other words, um, it depends on whether or not um, you've got a an S corp without EMP or an S corp with EMP, and of course the basis of that property in the hands of the shareholder is going to be fair market value. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about liquidating distributions. Uh, liquidating distributions um, are not like um, the rules we talked about for partnerships. It's like we talked about for C-Corps. So they follow C-Corp rules as far as liquidating distributions. They, uh, the S-Corp uh, recognizes a gain or loss on each asset <clears throat> they distribute in the liquidation. These gains and losses are allocated to the S-Corp shareholders, increasing or decreasing their stock basis. And in general, the shareholders recognize gain on the distribution if the value of the property exceeds their stock basis. They recognize loss if their stock basis exceeds the value of the property. So there's, there's potential for, in both a property distribution and liquidating distributions for essentially double taxation going on at both the S Corp level and the partner, or excuse me, the shareholder level. Another way that S Corps can be taxed at the corporate level is something called the built in gains tax. And so what this is, is if you um, have a situation where you have unrealized built-in gains at the time of the conversion to an S-Corp, um, 
if you dispose of that property within a certain amount of time, you have to deal with that built-in gain. And so it only applies if you have a net unrealized built-in gain at this conversion date and if you recognize net built-in gains during the first five years, well it's ten years now, as an S-Corp. And so look at those definitions of net unrealized built-in gains and net, uh, net uh, recognized built-in gains. Now what you have to look at is the fair market value of the assets being converted as a group and determine whether or not, whether or not there's a built-in gain as a group, not, at, not as individual assets. And so look at uh, example 22-23. You know, you've got some uh, assets that, that have individual built-in gains, but that's not really the point. And some that have uh, built-in losses as well. It's whether or not these assets that were uh, there and, and converted to the S-Corp as a whole have a built-in gain. So you see here the built-in gain uh, for the group is not a gain but a loss. Even though there's uh, the land has a built-in gain individually. So that's kind of how that works. If, if as a group, the property that's converted has a, a built-in loss, then you don't have to worry about this rule. And so, what does this tell you? Um, if you're going to convert, make sure you've got uh, enough built-in loss property that's being converted so that as a group you, you at least have a wash or a built-in loss, not a built-in gain. If you have a, a built-in loss in this whole asset group, you don't have to worry about this built-in gains tax. So there's some planning opportunities there is what I'm trying to tell you. Now the applicable tax rate on the built-in gains is a flat 35 percent. And of course any built-in gain would be allocated to the various shareholders pro rata. Okay, let's move on to just a few wrap-up points. There's some other taxes that the S-Corp could be subject to, but I just wanted to kind of hit those two. Of course, um, just like a C-Corp, if an S-Corp um, has a, a tax liability of $500 or more due, they must make quarterly estimated tax payments and filing requirements you simply file a, a little different form it's 1120s but it's due 15th of the third month after the s corps year end so that for calendar year which is most s corps the tax return would be due march 15th and of course, you can also uh, file for an extension as well. All right, so that's it. That's all I want to discuss on 
uh, chapter 22. 